Okay, so um, I did it wrong. Think about a particle moving horizontally. It can move right. It can move left. Okay, and it is the x-axis in, in terms of the x-axis is positive in one direction and negative in the other direction. Um, so let's start kind of from the back. The particle is moving left. You want to know when it's moving left? Okay. What would you say about the velocity if it's moving left, Sarah? Yeah, a negative so velocity. It's like the time is, is between 0 and 12. Uh -huh. So I think that is impossible. Is impossible? I don't know. Because uh, if you want to have cause of the. Well, if you want to make that expression negative, you have to have the negative time. Oh. Um, well, let's think about this function. This function is a cosine function, and what do you know about the general shape of the cosine function? It's a wave. Right? It's a wave. It's, 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 it oscillates, right? It goes up and down and up and down. So conceivably, it's not necessarily true, but conceivably at some points it could be down here, negative, right? So we're, that's where we're kind of drawing all these conclusions. If it's moving left, then the velocity itself would be negative. And the velocity function is a cosine function. Okay, this is where start to be confusing. Is it confusing? Yeah. Yes. Okay. This function right here is the velocity function. It tells you what? What is its output? Velocity. Velocity. The output is velocity. What's the input? Time. Time. You put in a time into that function and what comes out is velocity at that time. So I could guess, I could be, make a lucky guess, right? And if I guessed four seconds, just guess four seconds, and I plug four in there, uh, let's see, that'll cancel that. We'll get a two and a three. We'll get two pi over three, right? And what's the cosine of two pi over three? Not two pi over three. Right? The, time, the time has come to uh, internalize some of these values, okay? The time came last year, actually, but uh, the time has really come now. Uh, negative one half. Okay, negative one half. So what, do we, what does, what negative? What we just got was a number, negative one half. What's the significance of that number? We, we put four in there and we got out negative one half. Yeah, negative one half what? Velocity. Negative one half velocity. We have to have some units, right? Um, what could we call the units? Negative one half what? Meters per second. What? Meters per second. Could it be meters per second? Inches per second. Inches per second, right? The, the, the distance unit is not specified, but the time unit is seconds for sure. So distance units per second, right? So we just did find a time where the velocity is negative, and so the particle is moving what? To the left. But OK. OK. Um, yeah? It says, though, that like at time of zero, it starts at negative 2. So would it have to be to the left of negative 2 to be considered moving left? or? As long as it's moving to the left, in the left direction, okay. it's moving left. It doesn't have to, I know that's confusing, but you don't have to, you don't have to be to the left of the y-axis to be moving okay. in the negative. You're moving towards the negative region if you're moving left, right? That's what it's saying. Okay. And velocity is a vector. A vector has magnitude and direction. If you're moving to the right, your direction is positive. If you're moving to the left, your direction is negative. In the negative direction. Um, so I just guessed randomly the number four. four. At four seconds, what did we find out? Negative one half, Negative one half distance units per second. Let's call it meters per second. Okay? But that's not all. It says between zero and 12 seconds, when is the particle moving to the left? So you want to know all the times it's moving to the left. So we want to know all the times it's moving to the left. So we want to know all the times that the velocity function is negative, okay? Ooh, so we've got this cool. cosine function, it's moving up and down like this, okay? So if we want to find out between 0 and 12 seconds when the cosine is negative, how are we going to do that? It's negative. Huh? Just when it's negative? Just when it's negative, negative because, nine. now I know this is confusing, because you've got this cool. particle moving left and right, and then you've got this cosine function. And it's hard to make uh, heads and tails of what's going on, okay? But that's just the velocity function, okay? So, okay, I, got it. I mean, 
we could graph this, it wouldn't be that hard, it'd just be a cosine function um, with the period change, okay? And the period would be, let's see, take a little longer. Um, but we don't really need to, to graph it. What we do know is that this, uh, starting up here, going like this in some way, is a graph of how fast the particle's moving at any time, right? Does that make sense? So at time A, let's just call it time A, I won't be specific. At time A, look there, there's a positive value for the velocity. So where is the particle moving? To the right. Uh, here, at time, let's say, time B, right there, how fast is the particle moving? Or not how fast, but which direction? Right. How do we know it's moving to the right? Because it still looks like the cosine function is positive. It still looks like the cosine function is above the x-axis, which means it's positive, and if you have a positive velocity, which is what this is graphing, if you have a positive velocity moving to the right. Okay? Now how fast is it moving right there? Is it moving to the left? Why do you say it's moving to the left? Well, that right at zero. It is right. At, it's right where this crosses the x-axis. Oh, so it's, 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 not, it's not moving. Okay. This is not a graph of where the particle is, but how fast it's moving. How fast is it moving? Right here. It's not moving. It's zero. What's it doing right then? Taking a break. <laughs> Changing. Yeah. Direction, right? Because right after that, which direction is it moving? Left. To the left. Okay? And how do we know it stops moving to the left as we keep going this way? It's zero. Yeah, it's zero again. Right? So where is the particle moving to the left? All negative cosine values. All negative, well, all negative values of this function. Yeah. Yeah. All negative values of the velocity function. Okay? How are we going to find out where they're negative? Well, we are going to do some of that, but in general, in general what we need to do is find out like where this is, right? Where, where are these breaking points, right? And how do I find these breaking points right here and right here? That would definitely be the only places where the cosine could go negative, right? And so we do what? When the velocity is zero. When the velocity is zero, What's the particle doing? Changing directions. Probably changing directions, right? What's the only thing we can say for sure about the particle when the velocity is zero? It's not moving. It's not moving, okay? Since the velocity function is divided by the cosine, we know it's going to be turning back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, but you could stop and then keep moving in the same direction, right? So when the velocity function is zero, what do we know? Not moving. Yeah, whatever we're talking about is not moving. So we set zero equal to the cosine of pi over six t. Okay. Let's solve for t. Here's what we're doing. That's what people don't like, Mr. Stewart. Is you make them feel belittled and make them not respond. Did I make you cry? I was throwing a lot of guys. Just throw it out. There. Look, the cosine's not being multiplied by this quantity, right? It's like, it's like the square root of x. The square root's not being multiplied by x. It's just saying look up basically, look up the square root of x, right? Find the cosine of that quantity. So it's not being multiplied. So division by cosine doesn't really mean anything. Um, yeah, the time to go by. Like Inverse cosine, right? And all the inverse cosine means is this. It's very intuitive. Whatever value you plug in for t and then multiply by pi over 6 and then take the cosine, you want to get 0, right? So what we want to figure out 
when we say inverse cosine of 0 equals pi over 6, oh, it just means what I just said. It means find the values uh, that this would have to be, this whole thing, for the cosine to be 0. Not find the cosine of 0, but find angles where the cosine is 0. So where is the cosine equal to 0? Um, 3 and 9. 3 and 9, 3 and 3 and 3 and 3 seconds. So like, is that what we're going after? Um, Still like are you, don't use your calculator. Pi over, pi over 2 right? and 3 pi over No pi calculators pi. on this question. Where? Pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Uh, pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 and any, any angle that's coterminal with those angles. Yes. Okay. So um, let's call it pi over 2 plus, uh, you can start at pi over 2 and come down to 3 pi over 2, to pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, on and on we go. So we could say plus uh, 2 and pi, right? Yeah. Is equal to pi over 6, t. Wait, what did we put 2 and? Just that um, anywhere that is uh, up here, right, or down here, those cosines are 0. So whether it's pi over 2 or if I go from pi over 2 and I add pi, or no, not 2n pi, not 2n pi, just n pi. Just n pi, because I can add 1 pi, I can add 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, 6 pi, 7 pi, any multiple of pi, right? That's what n pi represents, any multiple of pi, where n is an integer. It could even be negative, you can go backwards. Okay? So did I clear that up after I confused it? Okay, let's clear it up. Well, we still got to find t, right? Time t. How do we just isolate t? Multiply by 6 over pi. So multiply both sides. 6 over pi. 6 over pi. All right, so we distribute through here, cancel here, cancel there. We get 3 plus cancel the pi there. And we get 6n. So any time that is 3 seconds uh, or 6 seconds more than that, 12 seconds more than that, 24 seconds more than that, uh, 6 seconds less than that, right? Because n could be negative. Yeah, multiples of 6, whether they be positive or negative. Though at those times, what's happening? The particle is moving left. The particle is no, not zero. moving. Not moving. It is stopped. Right? Because we set it equal to zero to start with. We write it down here. We solve for t. And we found out that any t that is 3 plus a multiple of 6, including 0 and negatives, that's where the particle will stop. OK. Well, let's find. We don't want to, that's an infinite amount of times, right? What times do we care about? From 0 to 12. From 0 to 12. So what times from 0 to 12 will you find? 9. 3. 3, three and 9. You got 3, right, when this is 0, and 9 when this is 1, and then you go past 12 if you do 3, right? 9 plus, uh, or not, let's see, 6 times 2, 12, what am I saying? 1, now. Yeah. 6 times 2 is 12, and if you add 3, you'll be past 12 seconds. So t can be equal to 3 or 9, those two times is where what happens? It stops. 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 Okay. Now that's just where it stops. We don't know what's happening otherwise. But we know that's where it stops, and we know the cosine function looks like this. And so this is probably 3, and this is probably 9, and probably in between, what's happening? Negative. What's negative? Velocity. Velocity, when velocity is negative, it means it's going left. You're moving to the left, you know, or down, depending on what your orientation is. So, but to be sure, here's what we know, though. Here's, here's what we know before I say the next thing. Between 3 and 9, it's either doing what? Forward or back. Moving forward or backward. Moving positive or negative, moving right or left, right? It can't, it can't change from moving to the right to moving to the left without first stopping, right? These are the two places where it stops, and in between, either it's moving to the right or it's moving to the left. How do we figure out what it's doing in between? Pick out any number in between. Pick out in between, anything between three and nine? Six. Five. We already did four, right? Six. We knew it. Dang. Four, we already did four, as a random guess. We know four was? Negative. negative. So everything between 3 and 9 must be negative, which means 
All the times between 3 and 9, the part interval is? Yeah. Moving to the left. I did it. I just have to pick my way in. Did you get it? Yeah, I got, I got the answer, but it was like a much different way. I did it much clearer. So we need to answer it, though. So, that, so the times are between, well, not equal to yeah because we just go like at the at those times it'll be stopped it won't be moving so between three and nine that's our answer now the wording might have been a little weird and and that kind of stuff but you had everything you needed right you knew about trig functions you deep down knew how to solve a trigonometric equation uh, you know what velocity is you know what it means when velocity is positive when it's negative in reference to moving right and left, okay? It was all there, so maybe some of the, the cloud and the haze needed to be cleared away so you could see things clearly. Think There are things that are confusing, like moves along the x-axis, okay, so it moves along the x-axis. And then I'm trying to imagine this graph here being on the same graph as the particle moving, right? That's something that's confusing. Like, the particle is actually doing this, moving to the right, moving to the left, moving to the right, moving to the left. But the graph of its velocity is, is not that, it's this. And then you have to stop yourself from thinking this is a graph of where the particle is, right? It's not one meter away and then negative meters away. This is how fast it's moving, okay? That kind of stuff takes, it just takes time uh, and familiarity, okay? So, how do you do that? Yeah, question. Um, did the part where it says the particle is at the position of x equals negative 2 even matter? Um, there are several parts to this question. The other parts are beyond what we have right now. And so that part applies to those other things. So no. But I wanted you to be able to realize that it doesn't apply to this question. That's, that's important to be able to do. Uh, so let's go on to the next one on just... Um, And we'll clear all this off and start on the next one, which means it might as well, I might as well, whoa, might as well take this and put it in the trash. No, Ooh, but I think that one. Trash. Oh, we'll do it later. Also, this is the second one. We'll just yeah, give, give this plenty of room to breathe. Yeah, the friends over here, you did that. Yeah. You did? Yeah, because we're friends. Can you show us? Yes. I know, dude. No, I want to do number three. Oh, number three. You want to do number two? Yeah, me and Kendra. You can do number two. Number two. You can do it. But let me just uh, help you imagine what's going on here. What is asking? Okay. Ready? Hey, now. Vera and also. That was not. The tangent line to the function h. Oh. There's some function h. It, we don't know what it looks like. It's really. Nebulous. We don't know what it looks like at all. But it's something, it might be like wavy like that. I actually have my pen so that when you watch this on YouTube, you can see it. It just moves, it, it might look like this, whatever. Okay? Okay, that was awful. Great. No, it, any, a function can look just like that. Okay, well, but something we do know is that um, there's a point six negative one on this function. So we could say like, um, wait, what is it? At four. So maybe this is uh, six. 6, negative 1. So now we can um, draw a, uh, a set of axes here and kind of give us some amount of scale. So this could be the point 6, negative 1. Right? Oh, that was gross. Um, and then we can then continue on. It would say the tangent line to the function. Oh, okay, so we're talking about this guy right here. It's tangent to this function right here. Okay. Any questions so far? No. Sure. It's tangent. Now I think I'll let Aaron take it. So we're talking about that tangent, right? That's you good. Can, do can you pick it up from there? Yeah. Okay. All right. Go, Aaron. Go. Okay. Intercepts the y-axis at four, so we have another point like a four here. Or is it number nine? Oh. Uh, so that goes right through the y-axis so at four. So we have two points now. Ah. So we have one point at six, yeah. Yeah. one, and then we have a four. Oh, then we do the slope formula. So four minus negative one. So, you know. so 
what's Aaron doing now? Slow. Y is 2 minus Y1, X2 minus X1. And yeah, then 0 so keep them straight. minus 6. I didn't have to turn them like that. That equals, uh, take this over here, that'll be, that'll be plus, and that'll be plus. That'll be a 5, that's a minus, and that'll be a negative 6. So we have a negative 5. Don't messed up, son. So, even though we're talking about slopes of tangent lines, which is a calculus thing, um, it turns out it's as simple as two points on a line, right? It tells you one point on the line. It tells you another point on the line because it gives you the y-intercept, and it's as simple as that. Sometimes the hardest thing about answering questions is relating how easy they are to answer. You want to bring calculus into these questions when you don't need to. What you have is two points on the line. It doesn't really matter that it's tangent to some curve. Okay? Okay. Good here? Yep. Of course. That was amazing. That's great. Stretch that. Number three, and somebody's gonna work out number three for us, right? A couple of people? Huh? Gonna work out number three for us? Can you run just where it? Yeah, we did it the long way. Yeah, apparently. It's long? Okay, whatever. It took a long time, that's fine. Connor did it the short way. Well, Connor? Okay, so there's this quadratic, and finding the velocity the first six seconds. Um, we found the height first. So the first, do I have to remember all the quadratics? No. Yeah. All the quadratics? Because I did every single quadratic for one, two, three, four, five, six. Because um, we thought we'd do it the long way. Cause we <laughs> oh, oh, oh. She's going bonkers. <laughs> you found all the velocities. All the heights. All the heights. Every second. You found all the heights. OK. So you <laughs> could, you don't have to write the calculation. Why don't you write like a table that says, Okay. At, at this many seconds. So um, So you subtract this from that, and you get 26 feet per second, except for it's negative. And then that, or that from that, and then you get okay. 158 feet per second, and you just keep doing that. Can I do the short version? Do the short version. Okay. Just, it out right before just pick a different color. Okay. Why don't you select all that, make it smaller, pick a different color. Oh, God. Can you do it? Can you do it? Is it this one? <laughs> I hope so. Oh, oh God. Start at the other bottom corner. Start at the bottom Here, corner. Here, let me do this. Real quick. <laughs> not, I'm not going to do it for you. I'm just going to make it easier. Okay? I'm just going to lock this so that it doesn't get in your way. There you go. Great idea. 
Oh, oh no, I knew it. I knew it. Just gotta. You won't select that white thing. It's locked. It, it can't get selected. So there you go. Oh. Uh, wow. <laughs> 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 Biggest square ever. <laughs> Now you got the tag. Oh. <laughs> oh, I know what happens. Okay. You lock, you lock in a tag. Two, three, three. Oh, gosh. I'm making a song. I don't care. You oh, can't. You can't. That's uh, that's 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 why? Because it's the initial tag. Okay, so that's where it is when? Um, beginning. At the beginning, zero seconds. And then you start with six, and you get it five range. Just before. Yep. You plug it in. And you subtract that. Yep, yep. And you get 636. Okay. And then you divide by six, because there's six. Because, because there's six times? Six. Sounds like it's ten. Because what? Can't put a lot. Six seconds is the time. One oh six feet per second. It's going down. Excellent. Uh, okay. So <laughs> it turns out now the average velocity thing we take all the velocities, add them up, and divide by six. We have to look at that because. I don't think it always gives you the same answer, but I need to think about that. Uh, so yeah, it won't. It won't work. It won't always work. The, the, the short work. version won't always work, so we always have to do that long version. No, no, no. The short version is good. The short version oh. definition of average velocity is average velocity is uh, distance over time. Oh. Distances. We found that time is or distance if time is done. Yes. Is that negative for the velocity just because it's moving down? Right? Yes. Okay. It has gone from twelve hundred <laughs> down. So on average. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, <laughs> okay. Now, now we're doing great. Now, let's do something here. Oh, okay. Let's not do that. Let's do this again. Okay. Move it down a little to there. <laughs> okay. Um, mm -hmm. This should say on. Say on the graph of a function. Okay, on the graph of a function. Yes. Yes, it's easier way to change. Well, you just, you just, yes. The slope. The slope of the graph uh, is the same as rate of change, because speed would, would be implying that we know the, the units that we're using. So rate of change, rate of change. OK, so now, what does that mean, rate of change? How can we define rate of change? Oh, no. Who wants to do Velocity is an example. It's a ratio comparing uh, x of, or x to y. x to y or y to x? Okay. So, are you packing up? What's going on? I'm not packing up. Let's kill her. <laughs> Let's kill them both. I don't need them. Okay. All right. So, a ratio. Comparing, comparing what? Why the heck? Not just why. Not just why. What why is? The y value. Not just the value of y. Not just like here is what y is and here is what x is. That's just the point, right? Comparing y to x is just like the variable. Times distance. What's important? Y and X are good. What's important about Y and X? What? That I guess we're using Y and X for shorthand for that. What are Y and X doing when we're talking about 
rate of changing, so changing two right? Two Comparing change in y over We're change in x. Yeah, so that's it. The slope of the graph Particularly what we're going to be concerned with is the slope at a point. The slope of a graph at a point is just a ratio, is the rate of change, which is just a ratio comparing the change in y, the change in the independent, the change in the, the change in the dependent, and the change in the independent. Okay? No. No, not okay. Yes. No, okay. I'm writing this down, that's all. It'll be online. No. No, don't move no. it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here we go. Oh my god. Who Lucky I would like some extra credit? Uh, Connor was yes. Oh. Here's what Connor has to do. The honor sucks. You have to recreate you know, the limit that we use for slopes for, for uh for the slope at a point. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Oh, okay. I believe so. F of X uh, oh, yes. so X I remember I'm doing this. Oh. You gotta recreate it. Uh, like you you draw it pictures <laughs> of where it comes from. And then oh. recreate it over here. Can I use my notes? Uh, yeah, you can use your notes. Oh, uh, no. Hey, no. Cheating. Cheating. Connor's not going to do it. You're explaining with fluidity and understanding. Yeah, all right. And absolutely. Okay. Don't. Put that code up there when we do that. You're up the road. Don't. Not that day, no. Don't right. suck, Connor. Code. Counting all your ohms. Let's be supportive. What? Okay. Um, screw up the road. <laughs> so what we're doing, like, what is the question we're trying to answer? Ooh. Find the rate of change at one point. There you go. Find the rate of change. Find the slope at a point. Go. Isn't this between two points, though? No. Nope. Well, we're going to use what you're going to find, what you're going to develop, to find the slope at that one point, right? But we start with two points. That's part of the explanation. But in the end, okay. the question that we answer is, how, what's the slope at the one point? OK. OK, so say we have like x1 here. OK. And Ooh. Good. Lines. Ooh. We have another point. It's just going to go there, but right there. <laughs> we have an x2. Keep going. Okay, this point has an x and a y, or it's just x. F of X. And this one. X2 and F of X2. Any questions so far? Nobody's got, nobody's got questions. Connor doesn't have to be the one to answer. You know, we don't trust them. Yeah, go over real quick why x1 is x comma f of x and why x2 is x comma f of x of three. Okay. Well, if you have an x value, <laughs> if you have an x value, how do you find out the y value? Put it into the function. Put it into the function. Yeah. So, so this represents, you know, this is the graph of the function. So the function is f, and if we want to know the y value at any point, any point at all, we put that that x value into the function. So at x, this should be x1, right? At x1, we take x1 and put it into the function. You know, it forms into the graph oh, okay. function. And then we get f of that, whatever. So this should be x1 and f of x1, and x2 and f of x2. OK. OK. Why don't you throw those x1s and x2s in there? x1, OK. Number two. OK, that's just Well, this is x. X1, comma, f of x1, x2, comma, f of x2. Superb okay. okay. job, Connor. Yeah. Okay, right. this rolling. distance between the two x's is no. as h okay. or uh, delta x, um, which we take this, it can be changed to um, here. x plus h over and f of x plus h. So you just rewrote something. What did you rewrite? 
Uh, the second X point. The second point, okay. Um, if you plug those in to find the uh, thing, which goes with the Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1, it fits in as F of X plus H minus F of X over X plus H minus X. Any okay. questions? We collect everything in, and then we let h go to zero. We get zero on the denominator. And this this limit isn't a way to let h be zero. It's a way to figure out what this yes. right here so is getting low. close to, closer and closer and closer to, as h gets close to zero. Okay. Yeah. That part's fine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, conceptually, yeah, it would. But like we said before, what it won't actually happen, right? Um, but we will see what, if you imagine um, putting these two points like this, and if I move these two points closer and closer and closer to each other, that line that goes to the both of them, it's gonna, like if I put it over here, it's gonna be changing a lot as I bring them closer. But as I get them closer and closer and closer, it's going to be staying real steady. And what this limit is gonna do is gonna find out exactly how slanted it is, what the slope of it is. Okay, but like uh, we said last time, what we need is limits, so let's get mm -hmm. into limits, all right? So, got our books, got something for Ryan here. Everybody has a book? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes, Ryan? No. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> That's uh, chapter one. Yeah, and this is the out. answers in the back. Oh. Oh. No, you don't have to check it out. It's yours. Take it. Take it. You double stamp it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was last year. year. That must have been Austin. No, you have a staple. Oh, no. 
Do you have a stapler? She does. Why? She's working it out for you. That's what that piece on the stapler is? Yes. Oh, oh my God. Changing lives. Here we go. It's Oh, yeah. All right, so let's start with Women's Never Known. Hey, 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 hey. Now we really have something to do, okay? So let's open up to chapter one. Uh, now we know why we need limits. Huh? 1.2. Solid call, solid call. 1.1 is kind of like what we did with this whole pyramid. That's very hard to do. You want the homework quiz? It wasn't a quiz, it was a. Garbage. Not garbage. It was knowledge. It's knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Jerky move. Oh, yeah. Tannin sucks. <laughs> Oh, that's not fair. Can I have this? One is chapter one, and then another one is the answer. This is answer chapter one. No, that's the whole book. Yeah, keep this on. Hold on to that. Hold on to all. I'm going to be honest with you. I write in my book all the time. No. Try to do it in pencil. What? Try to do it in pencil. I do. Okay, let's say that we wanted to take. Um, x squared plus 2x plus 1 uh, and we we wanted to know what the limit of this function as x gets close to 1 is. Right. Now we talked about this last year. Can anybody define what that means with a limit? As yeah, as we get arbitrarily close to one, right? Incredibly close to one. Well, we get uh, as we approach one, we see what this gets arbitrarily. So we get arbitrarily close to what, right? We find out what it gets close to. All right. Um, so for a simple function like this, we could just plug one. Plug one. We know that it's a parabola. It's not like it does anything weird. We know that it looks something like this, and that as we approach one from this side and from this side, right, let's say that's one, we're going to see what the y values are approaching. And th there's nothing weird going on. When we, when we plug one into it, it's going to tell us how high this is, and we know that the values on the right and on the left are going to be getting close to whatever that y value is, right? So what's this limit? One squared is one, two, three, four. four. So the limit of that uh, function is four. Okay? Beautiful. It's simple enough. Yeah? How is that a limit if it exists? I mean, if that's an actual value. Yeah, I thought a limit was something that creates, if you can't do it with that function. We want to be able to use limits so that we can talk about those functions and deal with those functions that can't actually take on those values. But it's still the limit. The limit is defined as, you know, really uh, casually, it's, it's defined as the y value that you're getting close to from the right and from the left. Okay. So it's not it's not a value that you can't get that that function. Mm -hmm. It's not. Just what you're getting close to. If you actually do get there, that's okay. It's still the limit. Yeah. So I was gone for all of the, like, the entire limits chapter. So did you just plug in one for all the x's, or is yep. that how you found it? Okay. Just plug one in because we start off easy. That's an easy function. We can just plug it in. Okay. Good key, Lolly. Okay. So the limit is just what value we're getting close to uh, as we're as we're using x's on the left and on the right. What y values are we coming down from and so you just plug in whatever it's approaching. So the x is, approaches 1, so you put plug in 1 for everything? Uh, not always, oh, okay. but um, in, ideal, in an ideal situation, yes. Okay. You just plug it in. OK. okay. But um, let's see. A non -ideal situation. A non <laughs> we, will, we will get to a non-ideal situation. But first, let's see. Let's talk about when limits do not exist. Okay. Oh, good. Oh. I know. I'll tell everybody. I'll 
I'll tell, I'll tell, I'll tell everybody when these things happen. Okay. So just graphically, I'll show you an example of when a limit doesn't happen. Are you gonna pretend like this is new? Okay. All right. So let's say that this is uh, two. Okay. We're approaching x equals two from the left. All right. And we'll say this is five. Okay. So as we approach from the left, what y value are we getting close to? Five. Getting close to five. We plug in uh, one point nine and one point nine nine and one point nine nine nine. We get values that are closer and closer and closer to five. Mm -hmm. We get four point nine and so on. Okay. Uh, but then we'll put this guy here, and the, the function will continue up. This will be six, okay? But what happens when we come from the right? Six. So, what do you say about this situation? When it does not exist. Does not. What does this mean, girls? I don't. I've never seen that movie. I remember from last year when we were seeing. She absolutely did not um, do that in her head. Really? Uh, did that, or she? She didn't do it through numbers in her head, but she might have been able to think of what the graph looked like and determine that the limit doesn't exist. I think she was told to say Probably it was in the script. Yeah, Lindsay Lohan's pretty dumb. So. Wow. Okay. <laughs> this is all on YouTube, by the way, so if you want people to hear you say that. Um, so that's one example of how a limit would not exist. Do you? I have no idea. Maybe I wanted to hear Aaron's. Um, I'm going to go in an order when I choose them. Um, so this would be, we just approach different values. So okay. whenever it approaches different values, then the limit does not exist? Absolutely. Okay. If you approach different values, you cannot have a limit. Yeah. All right. Here's another one. Let's say we have a function that looks like this. What's this right here? Asymptote. Asymptote. Okay. Now, what's true about an asymptote? A vertical asymptote. Not passed. Huh? Can't pass it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll never cross over it. Yeah. It'll never have that value. It'll never have that x value, which means there'll be no y value with this x value. So, what is this? Where's this graph going? Infinity. Infinity. Well, where's it going vertically? Infinity. It's going up to infinity. It's getting as close to. Let's say this is five. It's getting as close to five as it can get. But it vertically, which is what the limit is about, the, the output is what the limit is about. Vertically, it's going up to infinity. Is infinity a number? No. No. Uh, on this side, it's going up down to infinity. Down. It's going as we remember as we approach an x value from the right and the left. That's what we're talking about. So as it approaches from the right side, from the right side, it's going where? Up. Up to. Infinity, but infinity is not a number. So they're not approaching any value, right? We say it doesn't exist because uh, the function increases without, you remember this, without what? Bound. Bound, without bound. There is no bound on how big this function can get. So there couldn't be a limit. You couldn't say the limit is a billion, majillion. It just doesn't exist. Okay? Sometimes, though, Sometimes for this function, people will say this. Limit as x approaches 5 of f of x is equal to infinity. No, it's kind of numbers. Okay. And that is, you could say that, you know, informally, but it, technically, the limit doesn't exist. The limit is the number that you approach. Okay? You can get as close as you want to to this value, but that's infinity is not a value. It's not a finite value. Is there? Well, it means it was you only had it first grade. Ever since your last class. It was, Nobody. Was, Nobody. Nobody. Yeah. it was you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at another. This is just going to be a reminder. Can I clear this out? What? 
and talk about the sign of one whoa, sign of one of Rex. So this, this graph here, this example is uh, f of x equals the sine of 1 over x. And we want to know what's the limit as x approaches 0 of the sine of 1 over x. So let's take a look at, let's bring that back up, over time. Okay. So I'm going to zoom in, using a box, so zoom in because we can't quite see what's happening at 0. So let's uh, check it out. Right. So yes, the biggest. The, this is the sign of something. What's the biggest the sign can be? Zero. What's the smallest it can be? Zero. Almost zero. Oh, no. Not negative one. Negative. Smallest is zero. Be negative one. Okay. So this. What we'll find, if we uh, investigate a little bit further, we'll find that it just goes back and forth between one and negative one. It doesn't get bigger than one, it doesn't get smaller than negative one, and as we get closer to zero, it just keeps going up and down. It just keeps going between two values, okay? Let's just uh, confirm that using the table. How do we use the table to confirm that? That it's just going back and forth, and it's not settling down and getting close to a certain value. Won't ever be zero. Well, it's not that it won't be zero, it's just that as you get closer and closer to zero, it doesn't approach a single value. It just keeps going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. As, as far in as you want to zoom on zero, you'll just keep seeing up and down, up and down, forever and ever and ever. Okay. Okay. Zero with yeah, it would be error of zero because zero in the denominator, no good, can't divide by zero. This is an instance where here's a non-ideal situation. You can't plug zero in and just find out. Yeah? So is there an asymptote there or not? It's not really an asymptote either. An asymptote would imply that we could go down towards negative hole? infinity or up to positive infinity. It's not a, really a hole. If it was a hole, then we could still have a limit, right? Would it be just a, uh, like a whole line? Or something? It's a gap. Just there is no behavior like what you guys are describing. It just keeps going up and down. The, the further in you zoom, the more up and down it goes. And the faster it goes up and down. And that's all, the, that's all that's happening. That's all you can expect to see. It'd like be going, like if you could imagine taking this graph and like doing like an iPad or something and, and just zooming like this and, and pulling it apart, pulling it apart, those, those up and down oscillations just look like this infinite hallway that you can never reach the end of because it'll just keep you'll just keep pulling out more oscillations <coughs> as you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. Does that make sense? You just keep getting more and more oscillations the more you zoom in. Oscillations? O S C I L L A T I O. It's in your book. On page fifty one. Um Okay, so we have we have uh, the case where it could oscillate between two values. Now, this makes sense. This will make sense. Okay. I want you to think about the unit circle. Okay. What happens uh, when I 
look at a really big angle, what does that mean? Like if I look at a really, really big, like a, an angle of 375 pi, what does that look like? How do I draw that? Mm -hmm. Oh, like the big circle around. Mm -hmm. Well, well, how do I indicate that it's 375 pi? You should draw the arrows. Oh, around, 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 right? This is spiraling, spiraling, spiraling. It's like it's 375 pi, which is an odd multiple of pi, which means I eventually go to here. Okay? But all those spirals and spirals and spirals and spirals doesn't really get you anywhere. You just kind of spin around in the same place, and eventually you stop here, you figure out what the sine is. The sine is zero. The sine of 375 pi is zero. That'll happen for any angle. If you put on a huge angle, all that happens is that you could draw it out, these lots and lots and lots of spirals, and eventually you stop, you take the sine, and you're done. Right? And the sine goes between one and zero. One and zero. Or one and negative one. One and negative one. One and negative one. So if we look at this function, as we get close to zero, what happens when you put 0 0.001 in here? One divided by 0 0.001. What kind of number is that? Uh, point zero zero one is one is one thousand. So it'd be a thousand. Okay. So it would be a thousand. So we're taking the sine of a thousand. A thousand is pretty big. And you take the sine of a thousand. All you do is think about the unit circle. Go around until you're at a thousand radians, and then take the sine. Okay. And let's do another one. We'll go the sine. The, we'll do one over point zero 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 one. Is that closer to zero? Yeah. That x value is even closer to zero. So you put in smaller and smaller and smaller numbers, what's one over x doing when you put in a small, small number? It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So the closer x gets to zero, the bigger one over x gets. And all that that is doing is, it's, it's not random, but it's almost randomly selecting some angle, taking the sine of that angle, and then you plot it on the graph. Right? And the closer you get to zero, the bigger the angle gets find out the sine value, and you can just keep doing that forever and ever and ever and ever. The closer you get to zero, the bigger this value gets, and you just take the sine of that value. Right? And there's no settling down, there's no approaching a single value. It just keeps going round and round and round. Does that make sense? So there are three instances when the limit doesn't exist. Let's look in uh, the, the exercise section of 1.2. Talk about that real quick. Like. Mr. Stewart? Yeah. Is there a common notion two? There's a common notion one through five. There's one, there's one, there's one back there. And one is the Oh, on my side. Okay. Um but okay, so let's look at um, so I got number 10, okay, number 10. New doctors. Actually approaching is it goes. It's approaching two. So that's the actual limit is two. Okay? How about fourteen? Fourteen. The 
one that has x approaches three. Hannah? Doesn't exist. Why? What's the reason? Because um, is it because there's a zero in the denominator and that? That's why there's a, a vertical asymptote. asymptote, but the asymptote is causing a problem. It's because they're going to infinity. They're increasing without bound, they're decreasing yeah. without bound, right? Yeah. Even if they even if you could get to infinity, let's say that infinity was a number, negative infinity was a number, then what would be the problem with this graph? Um, they're approaching two different things. One of them is going to infinity, one is going to negative infinity. Mm -hmm. Right? It's the same problem as the one next to it, number 13. Mm -hmm. They're coming at one, the, the one on the left is coming up to one, and the one on the right is coming up to negative one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Um, if we just to, to go back to this the graphing calculator, let's say we start with, um, let's go with x squared minus 1 over x plus 1. Oh, and that didn't work. Divided by a plus 1. Okay, so we'll look at the graph. Graph. So what is uh, what is the limit as x approaches negative one? Limit as x approaches negative one. Uh, Looks like you can just go to negative one and go down to there, right? You go to negative one and go down to there. Okay, so let's look at the table. It'll do that for us automatically. So we should just plug in negative one and then figure out what's going on. But what happens? Error. Error. Why? Yes, it's uh, zero in the denominator. Zero in the denominator. Let's look at at the function. You put a negative one there, you get zero. Oh, yeah. So what do we have on the graph? Yeah, a hole. A hole. A hole. We have a hole. Yeah. So let's take a screenshot and bring it into the next screen. So truly, there is a hole right here. So how are we can't plug negative one in there? How are we going to figure out what it's approaching? Get really close to it. Get really close to it. How can we use the calculator to get really close to it? Zoom. 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 I think table trace would work too. I like table just because you get to see several values in one place. With trace, it erases a lot. So we'll get close to negative 1, and let's start coming in from the right of negative 1. So what's on the right of negative 1 but close to negative 1? Negative 1.9. Negative. 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 Negative 0.9999. Okay. Negative 2. Now let's go look at this negative 2. You see it's rounded, this negative 1.999. Okay. So it's not actually a negative 2. And then we'll come in from the left. How can we come in from the left? 1.0001, negative 1.0001. It says negative 2 as well. It's actually just a little bit below negative 2. But what do we find out? What is the limit? 2, negative 2. Negative 2, the limit as x approaches negative 1 of x squared minus 1 over x plus 1 is negative 2. Because on the right and on the left, we're approaching the same value. Okay, so we can have a limit if there's a hole. It's just what it's getting close to. <coughs> now, these properties here, they seem really basic. This isn't going to be in, in 1.3 now. These properties are going to look 
They're really basic sounding, and you would think, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but we're gonna challenge you to, to really show that you understand that those properties uh, work the way they're supposed to. Let's, let's just get down into it, okay? Um, so, but I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna challenge you to think a little abstractly. So we have f of x is some function, okay? We don't know what it looks like, we don't know what it does, we don't know what kind of values it has, it's just some function f, okay? And let's say that the limit as x approaches, what do we call it, c of f of x is something. Okay, it's just some value. Okay, it might be that the limit as x approaches seven f of x is twenty-five. We don't know. They're just standing in for those for those things. So c is some number and l is some number. Uh, we just don't know what they are. Okay, but let we'll just let those represent those values. So g of x will say the limit as x approaches c of g of x is k. Okay, so it's some value. Now k might be equal to l, and it might not. So the first property, if I were to take the limit as x approaches c of, f of, uh, f of x, what would that be? It would be l, right? I haven't done anything. It's just l. Okay. If I put a, a scalar multiple in there, like b, and then b, b, l. I think b, l, yeah. yeah. Well, think about b is a constant. If you multiply, well, let's think about this. The only thing changing here is f of x, right? As we put in values that are closer to c, what does f get close to? L. 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 The limit is up. It goes closer, closer, and closer to l, right? And as that gets closer to l, you just do what? Multiply it by b, right? So that b has like no effect. On the limit doesn't change the limit itself. So it's equal to b times the limit uh, as x approaches c of f of x, which is just b times l. So if the limit as x approaches 5 of x squared is 25, then the limit as x approaches 5 of 2x squared. Well, this x squared part, that's the function, really. Uh, that x squared part is going to, the limit of that is going to be 25. And then it gets multiplied by 2, so this would be 50. So that's, that's an example of what we're talking about over the head. This is number 1, this is number 2. Um, okay, so as x approaches c, what's f approaching? L. And what's g approaching? Okay. If I add these together, this part's going to get close to what? L. And this part's going to get close to? K. K. So uh, we just L. add L and K. Uh, oh, is this where you get like the g of f back? No. That's in a minute. And then it also works for subtraction. I'm going to imagine work. And these properties really are pretty straightforward, and they don't bend the mind a whole lot. If you multiply two functions together, this section is going to get close to L. This section is going to get close to K. Right? As X goes in and gets closer to C, this part gets close to L. As X does the same over here, gets close to C, this part is going to get close to K. So we just multiply the two together. What's that going to be? L divided by k. L divided by k. We have to put a condition on this, though. Oh, yeah, that k does not equal zero. As long as k isn't zero. Uh, such that k is not equal to zero. <coughs> and lastly, if you, let me bring this up for people in the back. If you take the 
limit as x approaches c, uh, there's a function f of x raised to some power. Well, you're going to be plugging values that are closer and closer and closer to c into here, into f of x. And then when you figure out, oh, that's approaching l, then you raise it to the n power. Uh, what's a polynomial? Many numbers. Many numbers. That's what the if we break down the word. That's what the words mean. Um, how do we define a polynomial? Like a function that's a polynomial. How do we define that? Coefficients in there. Three x to the third uh -huh. plus two x to the second yeah. plus seven x uh -huh. plus eight. My second name. Okay. Sorry. Uh, can we raise the degree of the polynomial as high as we want? Right. What's the degree? What does that mean? The largest power. Largest power that we see given to one of the variables. We got variables. Raised to powers, okay, not numbers raised to variables, right? That would be an exponential. That's not a polynomial. Okay. So we've got variables raised to constant powers, x raised to the third, x raised to the seventh, x raised to the fifty-six, whatever. Okay, the positive powers. Um, and then we might have some coefficients in there. So those are polynomials. Now what do the graphs of polynomials look like? Did you sketch in the air the graph of a polynomial just randomly from an out of nowhere? Not from a formula, but just like what kind of shapes do they make? Lots of different shapes. Lots of different ones, yeah. Here's a degree two, right? Something like that. Degree three, something like that. Degree four, something like this, or like this, or so how would you describe in general the shape of a polynomial? Yeah, it's cur it's a curvy thing. It's it goes up and it goes down. And it might go through the x-axis, and okay. But will a polynomial, just a polynomial, will a polynomial have any asymptotes? A polynomial, just a polynomial. No. No. no, it won't. It won't have any asymptotes. Will it have any holes? No. It won't have any holes. Will it have any kind of inconsistencies at, at any time? No. No, it's nice and what's called uh, continuous. Uh, and it's also something called differentiable. Okay, so for a polynomial, p of x, okay, if uh, p of c equals l, uh, well, let's just say it this way. Let's just say it this way. Uh, for the limit as x approaches c of p of x, how will we find that limit? Plug in c for x. Plug in c for x, because that's the nice thing about polynomials, is that if you, if you find a point on the polynomial, or on the graph of polynomial, nothing weird's gonna happen. You're not gonna be approaching two different values. You're not gonna be approaching by going off without bound. You're not gonna have holes. You're not gonna have vertical asymptotes. You can just plug c into the polynomial and found your own. Good. There's a fly. There's a fly. I'm sorry, you were saying it's like eight flies in every one of these. It's all without our words. Encouraging. Okay, so that's the nice thing about polynomials. If we can break things down into polynomials, I can plug in the value into this polynomial, I can plug in the value into this polynomial, and then those can interact however they will.
if the limit as x approaches c, this is going to be a com uh, the, uh, uh, com the composition of functions. x approaches c of f of x is L. And if the limit as x approaches L of g of x is k, so notice that L, this is the same L. Okay. And let's see what happens if we let x get close to c of g of f of x. This won't be too mind-blowing, because what's going to happen? Let's, let's just look at the inside first. We know that we figure out what f is, and then f, whatever that is, goes into g. Right? So what happens as x gets close to c in f? What does that get close to? L. OK, so then this becomes the limit as x approaches uh, c of g of, well, kind of l, right? It's not actually l, right? This act, what this is actually doing is getting closer and closer and closer to l, right? So as, as x gets closer to c, f of x gets closer to l, right? And and as the values that you plug into g get closer and closer and closer to l, as they get closer and closer and closer to l, you get, you get k. So that really becomes the limit as x approaches l of, for g of x. That goes to k. It make pretty straightforward sense. Um, so let, we're going to have to do a private short course. I just want you to remind you of, uh, of what Connor did earlier and why we're motivated to do this. Mm -hmm. Remember, we wanted to find the slope of the tangent line at a point. Uh, nice. And you guys could stop for a second and just stand still, making a lot of ruckus. Okay. The thing that's kind of motivating us to, to figure out limits and understand limits to be able to manipulate limits is at least one thing in this in this limit that allows us to find the slope of the tangent line when we just plug in h or plug in zero for h we get a zero in the denominator we need strategies to allow us to cancel out that h get rid of that h somehow so that all this is possible but we do need to know things about limits before we can do that we did do it last year then we're going to go way in depth on this Okay. That's it. Any questions? Okay.